All right, well, hello and good morning. I'm Leonardo McClarty, president of the Howard County Chamber and here with uh, Josh Bokey from Comcast once again for Policy Matters. And we're here with our, our special guest today and Senator Guy Gazzoni. And I'm sure uh, for those of you that have been around Howard County for a while, certainly Senator Gazzoni is, is no stranger to any of us, but just uh, for maybe a few newcomers, he is, uh, has served this this county now for uh, I'll just say a number of years, uh, going back to uh, his days on the county council, as well as at the House of Delegates, and then he's been in the Senate, uh, I believe, since uh, 2006, and now currently chairs the uh, Budget and, and Tax Committee, and so uh, certainly someone that knows a lot about how the the, the proverbial sausage is made in Annapolis, and so uh, definitely glad to have him here with us this morning to talk a little bit about um, legislative matters that are taking place in Annapolis and particularly in the Senate. And so, uh, uh, Senator Gazzone, uh, good morning and welcome. Good morning, great to be here. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Josh, any, any words for us this morning on behalf of Comcast? Well, I just want to say, uh, first, uh, good morning, Leonardo and uh, uh, Senator, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning. It's great to have you here. And uh, on behalf of Comcast, uh, you know, during the pandemic, uh, we have uh, put a priority on ensuring that our communities and our residents and customers remain connected. Uh, and that's one of the great things, I think, this morning about this uh, interview with Policy Matters is that it helps to connect uh, the business community and residents uh, with our local leaders. Uh, and so with that, uh, Leonardo, I think we can go ahead and get started. Well, excellent. So uh, we're going to take about maybe 20 minutes and, and talk with Senator Gazone about a number of things. And, and so first, you know, let's talk about this, this current session. Obviously, it's, uh, you know, going about in, in many uh, ways different than in, in years past with the, the same goal in, in mind. And so from your perspective, how have things been progressing and perhaps uh, what have you perhaps maybe most proud of to date? Well, I mean, it's uh, in some ways, um, you know, without jinxing it, shockingly good so far, um, given um, the constraints, um, you know, they've got us in plexiglass shields everywhere. And of course, we're all masking up and keeping distance and such. But we are meeting in person uh, for the floor and for voting sessions. And uh, like I said, so far, so good. And I think we're moving along at a reasonable pace um, to get the work done. Obviously, my biggest priority is the budget. But uh, and we're still in the midst of that for the 22 budget. But uh, absolutely, my the sort of the proudest moment. All of this is having worked with the both the Senate, the House, and the Governor to get a relief uh, uh, plan uh, passed. And if you put it in the context of uh, the sort of the difference between Washington and uh, Annapolis, um, the fact that we can't uh, deficit spend as Washington has and, and does, um, uh, and, and we've seen it through a number of relief plans, including the one the Biden administration is coming forward with, the fact that we don't have that kind of flexibility and, and money, and yet we were still able to come up with a little over a billion dollars in relief that went out to all kinds of folks and businesses, individuals who are struggling, um, certainly um, very proud that we were able to pull that together. Yeah, that is definitely a, a big plus, uh, and and for sure that a you know host of Marylanders will certainly benefit from, um, in, as you know, from truly our, our business community as well as to our our residents and institutions and, and and so forth. And so, you know, one of the things you just talked about is obviously the budget does come you know through your committee and and so forth. And so maybe just share a little bit about how are how are things progressing in that front process and, and ultimately how are things looking as you kind of look out on the horizon? Right. Uh, this has been um, uh, just sort of an extraordinary experience this last year. I mean, obviously, for, for, for all the reasons that we all know about COVID and such, but from a budgetary standpoint, it has been um, such a roller coaster and such a, a, a difficult time. I've never seen things change so dramatically 
within the course of even less than a year. And when we left last year about this time, um, we were getting early projections in May of, of sort of devastation, quite frankly. Um, we expected coming back around this time, um, having maybe four to six billion dollar problem. And just to put that in perspective from a from a general fund standpoint of a $20 billion budget, um, that's big money, um, as, as anybody uh, could imagine. Of course, the CARES Act um, uh, helped pretty dramatically from a lot of standpoints. The unemployment insurance uh, benefits and the additional payments that were made um, really started to turn things around. And, um, uh, you know, we, we could see pretty quickly that we were dealing with um, sort of two economies. One that, uh, that some people were doing um, okay, and in some cases really succeeding, and in another where people were, were really um, falling behind. It was those that were doing well that actually helped um, bolster our budget prospects. And so we went um, sort of period, sort of jumping piece by piece along the way to a point where we entered up, entered this session where we were in that position where we could do something uh, with the Relief Act. And now uh, with the, the, the Biden plan apparently moving forward, and we'll see something early uh, this week, um, we have gone from a place, again, from sort of, sort of utter devastation from a budgetary standpoint to a place where we're, in, we're on really solid ground um, to continue to help um, straighten up uh, uh, our economy and help those who are, have, have struggled the most. Well, certainly great news. And I've, I'm going to talk a little bit about maybe the, the stimulus uh, package in a second. But uh, Josh, uh, any, any questions you have? Well, I, I, you know, I think you know, Senator, you raised a really good point about you know where things were looking a year ago, uh, a little less than, and then now, especially with the Relief Act coming through the Senate, I, with the um, with the prospect I think to be an infrastructure bill following the Relief Act, is there a sort of sense of perhaps optimism that there might be funding availability for some of those really needed infrastructure projects in the state, and has there been any? preliminary thought in terms of, you know, if that, if that bucket was to come down, what, what would be the, what would be the needs perhaps to be addressed? Sure. Um, yeah, there's a, uh, the, there is a sense of, um, sort of guarded optimism as we go forward. Um, uh, the needs, uh, stretch, um, across the board. Um, you can think of obviously initially things like bolstering up school construction. You can certainly think about transportation projects, um, both uh, roads and uh, transit. Um, you can sort of start thinking out of the box a little bit too uh, on um, finishing up. And it's interesting because of course, Howard County was a, a leader in helping the state on broadband access uh, several years ago. Um, that may be another place where uh, we can uh, see that kind of infrastructure um, built out at higher levels into places where um, it, it hasn't reached um, uh, so far. Um, so I think, you know, um, at the moment, it, with the speed at which everything has been happening, um, we're really trying to do our best to keep our heads on straight and just um, think about what really matters. Um, what really matters to, to folks um, to, to get as many people as we can in a place where they are in jobs, in, in educational settings, and all the things that you'd want in training um, to get them in a place. And, and it is a combination of both operating and capital expenses. I think one of the things is that we will see from the Biden plan, um, it initially, especially this first plan even, um, is that it, they are one-time dollars, right? So it's they are operating dollars in many cases, but they may be uh, something that can be thought of from a PAYGO perspective. 
it, you know, we're, we're working through all of that and trying to think about what the priorities uh, should be. So it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a good place to be in, um, but it's also a huge responsibility to um, do our very best in a very short order of time to figure out what is what? What are the the most effective? What are the most cost effective ways to set up? Because the budgets always are about, from my perspective, how are we? How do we use the resources that 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 uh, the taxpayers uh, put forth to build the community, to build the the state that we really want to live in, and that we're going to be all be as successful as possible? Doing that is an ongoing project having the opportunity to have some additional resources uh, right now to do that sort of in quick order is, is, is a big responsibility. And so uh, on that note, I, I guess, how, what are perhaps maybe, and I think you touched on the summer, what are the, the challenges or how perhaps even is the process different perhaps now that you're in session and you have the house set to vote on the, the Senate uh, package and subsequently, if all goes, I think as anticipated, the president's signature by weeks in. So you've now got a another package that's been signed while session is in. Whereas conversely, you look at, you know, I guess this past summer, or even if you look at the the, the bill that was passed um, late, late, you know, last year, and session hadn't started. So how does the perhaps the process differ in terms of trying to prioritize and think about expenditures, recognizing that you've got dollars coming from Washington in the mix of a general assembly session. Right. So let me first um, say from a, um, an, an analysis standpoint on revenues, um, we will know uh, tomorrow um, the March numbers um, that come out of the border revenue estimates. Of course, that drives the budget um, dramatically. And some years you might get a write down, which uh, makes things tougher. And in other years, you may get a write up. And I think there's good reason to believe that there will be a write up. Why is it? Why are those projections going to be a write up? Because in part, um, uh, the stimulus program um, from the Biden administration, um, if it reacts, uh, like the CARES Act, the original CARES Act did, um, it will uh, sort of signal, and, and of course everybody um, understands that with the, with the additional use of the vaccine, the opening up hopefully soon uh, of, of all segments of, soci uh, of our society and our economy, um, those numbers are gonna go up. So, um, we find ourselves in a, in a pretty good place where um, we will both be dealing with in the midst of the budget and the, and the analysis of the 22 budget, which actually starts in uh, July, on July 1st, that we may be seeing uh, a few additional dollars there, as well as what we are due from the federal government through the, through the plan it's sort of a it's 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 a big package. What it what it means is that as we're trying to um, analyze um, what is possible, um, there are our own set of rules under the budget process, and then there are the rules that the federal government will attach to the money that comes from them, and the mixture of those uh, rules. Um, are, um, are are just a new place for us to be thinking about things. Um, for instance, here's a here's one piece that we've become aware of, which is uh, uh, interesting. Um, so uh, within uh, the plan, uh, states are not allowed to use this money um, for tax uh, cuts. Um, which on some level you would say is, is, is logical, right? Um, why would the, the feds give us money so we can do a tax cut? Um, why wouldn't they could theoretically do some of those things on their own? So they're giving this money really for us to deal with 
the nature of the pandemic. But it, it, it then affects how we're thinking about how we were dealing with and what we might have done if that money wasn't there. Because not only is it um, something that um, uh, they won't reimburse, they will actually charge it to us. So in other words, it would cost us double to do uh, a, a tax cut, if you will. So it's an interesting situation, understandable in ways, but but also if, if states are already thinking about doing something in a certain way, now this new sum of money will alter the way you're thinking about doing things. And that's one example. There are actually more um, rules and regulations associated all, with all of this to try to uh, uh, put it all together. And again, in a very short order, um, and quite frankly, even the things that I'm saying here today could change, um, could change through the regulatory process. We won't have uh, much of the federal regulations that deal with all this money probably for several weeks on out. So the money will be there and then, uh, but we'll still be sort of in, uh, somewhat in the dark trying to figure out what to do. Certainly interesting, interest, interesting times to, to say the least. So I, I know we, uh, we're going to have only a few more minutes left with you uh, due to your schedule this morning. And so I wanted to uh, shift to just uh, something that I know that for many of our, our small business members, that they will certainly appreciate if, if it uh, continues to, to move as we think it will. And, and that is uh, what is Senate Bill 880, which is basically deal with uh, kind of income tax and, and, and pass through, which is really something that will be beneficial for our small businesses. And so maybe share a little bit about that legislation and, and how it's progressing to date. I know that we've, you know, have sent a letter in uh, stating our support, I think when it was, uh, came up in committee, but uh, if you would share a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to remember the number exactly, um, but I assume you're talking about the pass-through entity. Correct, yeah, it's the pass-through entity. Um, so actually it was my bill last year. Correct. And all that we're doing this year is actually making some technical changes to it to ensure that it functions in the best possible way. And of course, the idea simply is that for those entities, they will be then the individual members of those entities will be able to take uh, full advantage of their state and local tax uh, deductions that they wouldn't normally be under what was uh, the former president's um, uh, tax plan from several years ago. Um, it turns out that that bill right now isn't necessary because we were able to put those provisions into the Relief Act. Um, and we did that um, to try to speed that up as much as possible, um, knowing um, sort of the nature of where tax season was and, and, and the electronic filing um, requirements. So that actually is already uh, in law. It's uh, It's been passed. And um, it should be a, a great benefit um, to uh, Marylanders who have that, um, who, who do have pass through, pass through entities. Um, and quite frankly, um, uh, the best part about it in a lot of ways for, for us and from a budgetary standpoint is it's really um, something that they're going to be saving on, on their federal dollars. Um, so it's, uh, it, I think it's a, it's a, it, was a, it was a great sort of common sense help um, Maryland businesses kind of bill. Well, that is certainly always good to hear. Josh? So I, we all know that normally during this time of year in Annapolis, it would be bustling with activity, right? And especially with crossover date coming up and you'd have everyone from school groups to small business owners to environmentalists all coming in and connecting. And I just have to ask that, you know, given your experience at Annapolis, how is that different this year with now, you know, essentially almost no one in Annapolis, a hybrid, and how has it been sharing the committee uh, virtually? How do you maintain those connections? How do you, how do you continue to do that, I think, and stay connected in such a unique environment? Right. Um, you may be surprised to know um, uh, that, and maybe not because everybody's, as they say, a little zoomed out, if you will. 
um, that I have had more contact um, with folks this year than I have had in any years before. Um, we don't have the, literally physically don't have the time uh, to do the meetings um, that used to come up. People used to set up a meeting and there was a certain amount of time and they'd come into the office. Well, now um, it's almost like any hour of the day um, is available uh, for Zoom, which is got its sense of comfort, as we all know, to be able to do things from your home, or actually I, I am in my office um, today. Um, but um, just to give you some perspective on that, um, I have never had to take uh, meetings over the weekends. I literally will do 20 or 30 meetings during the weekends now um, as a catch up because the only time we can squeeze it in because so much time is is already built in with with these zooms on other matters and other things. So um, in some ways, um, uh, those who want to reach out to us, um, this is a, a better situation, I suppose, because um, you don't have to schlep down to Annapolis and and do all do all what you normally do. The same token, as we all know, the the lack of sort of the uh, immediate human contact uh, is playing um, you know a little havoc on all of us. I think um, it's not as easy to communicate uh, as it was. Uh, when when you were having those direct connections. It's also not as easy for people to grab us as we're walking between things and you could solve things in, in a couple minutes and, and now you pretty much guarantee you're gonna set something up for 10, 15, 20 minutes on the Zoom um, that might've been done in, in a minute or two. Um, it's an interesting place to be, um, an interesting time to be. The committee I think is functioning well uh, again, for the most part, um, the hearings um, are, again, fine. I think we're getting opportunity for people to communicate. But even like the, the voting sessions, which we are in person on, um, it, it's a different, I mean, it's just a different feel. It's just, uh, I think we're all getting used to the fact that, that we're talking to each other through plexiglass shields. Um, but it, 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 it's working. And we're, we're all adapting. I told my staff on day one, the word for the session was nimble. We need to be nimble. We need to um, uh, take opportunities to make improvements along the way. And that's what we keep doing. Um, and, uh, you know, people are, 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 are absolutely reaching out to us. Um, the level of communication already had been increasing pretty dramatically just by the nature of social media and email and all those things. I remember when I first started as a staffer for Shane Pendergrass um, back in 19, uh, I think it was 88 or 89. Um, I remember we'd get maybe four or five letters in the mail every week. And I'd sit down and I'd work to make sure that those letters were answered well and their constituents were handled well. You know, staff sizes haven't increased very much since then. Um, so we're still trying to do our best, but we're getting 300, 400 emails a day. And it, it's, it's a different world. Um, you know, everybody's doing their best. And this is, I'll tell you, one of the most challenging parts has been the unemployment insurance um, because it hasn't been perfect. Um, and uh, our staffs, our, our individual staffs are taking an enormous amount of time just working those issues because it's not working through the Department of Labor many times, although they're working hard too. I mean, I know everyone is trying to do, it's just um, there's an accelerated level to just about everything that's going on right now. Um, it's an interesting time to be alive and working on all of this. Um, and it's still an honor. It's, um, it, it has gotten dramatically bigger um, by its very nature uh, over the last, 20 some odd years. I, I can only imagine. The one thing I will say that certainly has been a, at least a positive from, I would say where I sit and, and some others that have, you know, made that trip to Annapolis and, and you end up, 
you know, oftentimes, let's just say I'm fortunate here in Howard County, you know, you figure, you know, 35 minute drive and, and so forth, but you drive down, you know, the sit sometimes two, three hours, you know, four for, for two minutes at the mic. Whereas yep. the, the one thing I will say that has helped with uh, with Zoom is the fact that, you know, you testify and you you go into the meeting and you you kind of sit you sit on hold, but you're at least sitting in your office and then they allow you in and you speak. And after you finish, you, you're out and you haven't really lost any office time. So I, I think certainly for I would say the, um, you know, association professionals whether it's proponents, advocates, what have you. I guess for those that participate in the process, in some respects, it's been easier from a testifying standpoint, even if you miss those opportunities, like you mentioned, to be able to walk with someone, you know, from one hallway to the next or to the water cooler or, or what have you. But um, one thing, certainly, I, I know you've got a, a, a tight schedule and, and want to be conscious of that. And so we're going to prepare and, and, and wrap things up. Uh, but one, I just want to thank you for, for joining us today and, and for your um, for your leadership uh, in Annapolis and the leadership you exhibit here in, in Howard County. And, um, you know, as we prepare to part, want to allow you any maybe closing, uh, closing remarks. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing that um, probably um, we all were hoping for and believing in a sense of optimism to get through this. Um, I very much um, have had that throughout, as tough as it was at times, but um, I think we have actual physical proof, if you will, that it is getting better. And I know there are people that there are obviously people who are really hurting in a lot of industries still, but uh, in terms of the finances of the state and the way in which we might be able to continue to help people um, and the fact that the vaccin vaccination becomes more widespread, even though that's had its, its troubles, um, uh, I continue to be pretty darn optimistic um, about uh, the opportunities and uh, what we can see on the other side um, moving forward. So um, I look forward to seeing all of that uh, as it manifests. Uh, I look forward to working with you guys in the chamber as we do our best to, uh, to sort of create that community and create that state that uh, I know we all want to be proud about. Excellent. Well, thank you again. And, and Josh, any closing remarks uh, for you? And, and so, with that, I want to thank everyone for uh, for tuning in, whether you see this uh, live or if you, you catch it on Facebook or, or YouTube a little bit later on in the day. I certainly invite everyone to come back and join us next Monday when we'll be back at our, our normal 830 hour. Uh, well, we will have with us Delegate uh, Trent Kittleman. And so, uh, so again, thank you all and have a, a great rest of your day and continue to stay safe.